Hello, welcome to Free Will Science and Religion. I'm Chandler Klebs, and I'm here with George Ortega, Nick Vale, and Jamie Soden. And today we were going to be talking about the issue of sexuality and how people believe that being gay or straight is a choice. This is one of the first things that led me to see that people don't have a free will. And I've talked about this subject with Jamie, and I've, and I've seen another Facebook friend, you know, talk about this issue as well. And what's so interesting about it is there's so much hatred over this issue. There's so much hatred. It's like, you know, when somebody doesn't fit their, um, idea of what sexuality is, or they, or they, or they want to be married to someone of the same gender or whatever that might be, well, then you have a lot of people, usually they end up being very religious, who ha have certain beliefs that this is a sin, and they tell people they're going to hell for it. And th there's it's wrong on so many levels, because when you think about it, no, we already know um, that people's um, feelings about sex is not a choice. And perhaps we can use that as an example of explaining how people don't really have a free will where they can just choose whatever they want regardless of their po past causality. All right, well, Chandler, I mean, you say we already know that sexuality isn't a choice, but I mean, actually, that, that's part of the debate. In other words, a lot of people don't believe that uh, completely apart from this issue of free will. You know, in other, in other words, a lot of people believe that um, that free will that, that that we have free will, and but they or they they believe that that that, that uh, homosexuality is a choice, for example, and and they, they try to deprogram people. You know, they, they spend a lot of money, just you know, a lot of effort, just trying to get people um, to just like be straight and stuff. So like. You know, when you say we already know that, what are you basing it on, on like um, a certain scientific um, finding or? Well, when I said that I was talking more about how we already understand that nobody has a free will, but how I was actually, but if I wanted to explain, like, let's suppose that we're talking, because we're probably talking to an audience of free will believers. So maybe I need, I need, definitely need to make this appeal to them and it's not, in a way they can understand it. Because people, um, I think they understand that people don't choose who they, you know, uh, are sexually attracted to, who they fall in love with. And this applies whether you're straight or gay or any of that. I mean, we know that. Um, we know that people, um, for whatever reason, feel a certain way about certain people. And and I actually don't know too much about that because I'm I'm kind of asexual, but I really want I really want people to not be judging and blaming and hating people who don't fit in with their beliefs about what's traditional or biblical or what's moral or what should be legal or any of that. Because um I mean if you think about it straight people reproduce and that the only reason we're all alive today is because of sexual attraction it's, it's some kind of a biological thing but this is what's so interesting is it's not uh it's not like something that people choose and this is even for people who um don't understand that determinism and indeterminism both rule out uh free will or free choice a lot of people have still come to understand that sexuality is not one of the chosen things. Even if they believe in free choice, they view choice as applying to other things, but then they see um, sexuality as being similar to the foods that taste good to you or the music you like, stuff that you just, you just, that, ha that you have a preference for something over something else. And I, that's how a lot of people, even though they'll never fully understand the illusion of free will, some people understand that certain things are not a choice. And those people tend to think that we have limited free will, but perhaps we could address this. Um, do you guys have anything to say about it? 
Um, All right. Uh, the, basically, yeah. the um, the issue of free will has you know, extreme relevance because, um, yeah, the, this this debate about whether gays, you know, choose to be gay or whether they're born. I mean, once you understand that nobody has a choice in anything, that nobody has a free will, all of a sudden this debate vanishes, evaporates. In other words, like all of a sudden there is no debate. You know, it's obviously completely crystal clear that uh, a, a guy, a person who's gay does not choose to be gay. They were they were either born that way or somehow they were conditioned that way. But whether it's conditioning or birth, heredity or environment, a combination, whatever, there's absolutely no possibility that a person could ever choose to either be gay or straight or whatever. So like, again, this this, this issue of free will has major right to the, to the issue of, you know, whether gays can choose to be gay or not. Yeah, it definitely has relevance because when you think about it, um, who would who would choose to be gay um, in a culture where that's frowned upon, as it is in many places in the world? Who would choose that um, when they know that people are going to hate him or perhaps even kill him for it? Because that does happen in places. And so let's let's go right to that, Chandler. Yeah, because yeah, right. that's the yeah. problem. You know, essentially, like when, you know, the problem with, with the whole, like, because people in free will hate and condemn and discriminate against people that choose to be gay, whereas, like, if people understood that, like, choosing to be gay is kind of like being born a man or a woman, you don't choose that. If they understood um, stood that, then, you know, there would be no rationale for the hatred and the blame and the discrimination. That, you know, that, that's why this um, free will, you know, issue is so relevant to the gay. Yeah, and perhaps it will be because of that that those people will understand, um, you know, our message in general. That nobody's to blame for being what they are because they didn't choose it. Because it applies to more than just sexuality. But when we first understand that people don't choose that, well, that's pretty, pretty much pretty basic. Um, so perhaps, like, when we think about it, like you mentioned, George, if somebody um, is gay or straight, it either has to be something they were born with, you know, it has to be some kind of a genetic or biological thing, or it has to be conditioning, it has to be environmental. Um, and I'm and I'm not sure what environmental factors would would cause one or the other, um, but I think we we know that both um, genetics and conditioning both rule out choice because anything about us, anything we prefer, anything we think or or feel, and, and every detail is either some kind of a biological thing in our past or something environmental, and either way, we did not choose um, that environment or biology because we would, have, we would have had to have existed before we existed, <laughs> for one thing. And even if somebody before they were born did exist in some sort of, um, in some way, and then they were were supposedly given a choice between do you want to be born a man or a woman or black or white do you want to be born in this country or that country well even if such a thing happened on what basis what reason or cause would that choice be based on so even if you had that sort of magic where you get to choose where you're born who your parents are and your biology and environment and all that that choice would still be based on your knowledge, which is based on some type of environment and prior causes. All right, and one thing we have to acknowledge when we're addressing this is the, the various uses of the word choice. In other words, like when we're using the word choice and we're saying nobody chooses anything, we're, we're basically using the most literal sense of choice as in, you know, like, Basically, that we actually have an option and it's up to us. Nothing that's not in our control is making us choose. You know, for example, a robot that's programmed to, let's say, turn left when it encounters an, uh, an object, you know, an obstacle, then, you know, the, you might think that the robot chose to turn left, but no, it was programmed that way. So, like, so, I mean, what I'm trying to say also is, like, 
there are choices we make in life. You know, for example, to a great extent, happiness is a choice. To a uh, great extent, I mean, we, we kind of make quote unquote choices every day. What we're going to do, what, what our what our ambitions are, what our hobbies are. You know, all all these are cho choices. So in, so in that sense, relative to this gay debate, like back in Greek times, I think. The, uh, a much larger percentage of their population was gay than, than now. Like, I think the figure now is about 10% in the United States, maybe across the world. Which I think that seems like really high, you know, but, but I, that's apparently according to the research. So, um, but, you know, I think we do have to acknowledge, so like in a sense, you know, people may be gay for whatever reason, you know, they may not be born that way, but, but right, the, the, is that fine that they're choosing that and 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 i guess you know theoretically if they chose to be gay and it wasn't genetic then theoretically they could choose to not be gay but again the, the main point is like even if like if, if if people like deem it desirable to try to like influence people to like who are gay to not be gay and stuff and they succeed or attempt it you know the, the sailing point is they have to acknowledge that that nothing is up to that person, you know. That again, we're we're like hardwired, programmed beings, you know. So so and and the reason I say this because like so that understanding minimizes or eliminates the animosity. You know, in other words, people say like, well, you know, like you should you should be straight because that's you know that's the way to, uh, to be and all that. So like to the extent that people we don't have a free will, fine. They, try to change themselves or other people, but it would be done in a much more civil way. Yeah, and you said something kind of interesting there, because basically, even if people were, for some reason, successful in changing and reprogramming people to be straight instead of gay or whatever, well, it still wouldn't be up to that person, but it would be the conditioning of other people that changes them. And so even from that perspective, that their, their biological environment factors that made them one way and then whatever process that made them another way was still not up to them. And another thing that's very important because, you know, um, there might be people who are angry and blaming the people who have judged them for being gay. There have been people who are saying, oh, you're bad, you evil, abominable sinner. You're going to hell and God hates you because you're gay. Um, there are people who tell um, these people that. So then these people get angry at those people. Like these people, they know they're not at fault. They know that they didn't choose to be gay. Um, but then they might be blaming those other people for blaming them. And we need to make sure that they that we we that they understand they can't do that either, because those people also did not choose to be taught in such a way that being gay is a sin or something like that. That's important too. And people seem to um, uh, get the wrong idea about sexuality a lot of times when you mentioned it. I mean, there's a difference between. Um sexual intercourse and being attracted to something. I mean, you can be attracted to something, but still be a virgin. And the, a lot of people don't know how to separate the two because um, there is a difference between an attraction um, and an actual thing that people are doing that, that, all, that probably has something to do with the attraction, but it's not the same thing as the attraction. You know, like, for example, I might be attracted to bananas. Like, I'm attracted to eating bananas. Um, I'm not sexual about bananas. Just, in, just want to clarify that. But, um, but yeah, I, I am attracted to the idea of eating bananas. But that does not mean that I just eat every banana I see. Because I usually have to pay for them in the store before I start eating them. So I, un so I understand that. So not every... Imp you, you have limited stomach capacity, so you, it's not like you can eat, eat an infinite amount of bananas because you can't. I mean, there's limited resources for one. Well, yeah, that's true. But my my main point being that not, ev not every desire leads to an act at every time if there's a reason not to act on it. And that's that's important, too. And what's interesting is, yeah, people do need to separate an attraction from the act. Um, in fact, Jamie, we've talked about this too, and this is a slightly related issue, 
of people who um, hate the the pedophiles who are, are, are in some way attracted to children, but they confuse the issue and they think that all pedophiles are child molesters, and that's not necessarily the case. I don't have an exact figure like a, on like how many uh, pedophiles are actually a misuse of and stuff. But... Essentially, like with nothing, you know, it's, it's taken or wrong to use the to mean someone who has these kind of like feelings towards children and and never acts on them. And I say that because, like for example, you might a person may walk um, um, by a bank every day or something and say to themselves, "Gee, I wish I could rob this bank and have all the money or something." But the person never. Attempts it never whatever. So you wouldn't call that person a bank robber, right? So in other words, in the same sense, like you wouldn't don't think it'd, it'd be it's right or fair to call a person who might have these thoughts about children or or you know whatever you know the 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 term because I think in most people's minds you know this is a part of culture the way what words mean I think in most people's minds the pedophile um, means that the person actually has committed a, an act against a child a child so again look this this is do a very um, from, george i do get that i mean the, the first impression that people get when they hear the word uh, pedophile or pedophile do, depending on where you live like you know it's pronounced differently like you know different places in the world but when people hear the word pedophile you are right they, they seem to uh, think it's synonymous with sex offender what i'm trying to say is right is that that people should not be persecuted for thought crimes you know what i mean because if if a crime's imaginary, like if they're thinking about it but not actually committing them or not threatening to do these things, then they're not committing the crime, are they? It's like exactly. So right. So let's. So getting back to the the, the gay thing. So essentially, one of the things yeah. that is really really wrong about the free will belief, because you got to imagine, like, uh, if if nobody believed in free will, right? That means nobody would be. Um, blaming gays for doing something that's wrong, whatever. I mean, they might still consider it wrong. In other words, like a person who's a kleptomaniac, somebody who steals, right? Everybody acknowledges that the act of stealing is wrong. If the person has a disease, I mean, you can't really blame the person for having a disease. So the point I'm trying to raise here, though, is that, like, there's a lot of discrimination against gays that is founded on free will belief. For example, like the marriage laws, right? That that um, the equality in mal- marriage issue that a lot of gay couples are denied rights. Heterosexual couples have because they're considered gay. And again, if if, if like they had, if it was a disease, if, if, if homosexuality was considered a disease like kleptomania or psychopathy and in some cases then i don't think this this discrimination there would be less likely to discriminate in barriers against somebody that everyone knows really you know could not have chosen it that they were like you know that it's considered this or condition that, that wasn't is, chosen by them conspiracy nutcases who seem to blame homosexuals for the problem of aids and um you know other things you know. Yeah, well, you got to realize, Jamie, there are people who try to say that women who wear jeans are the cause of earthquakes as well. It's, it's another conspiracy theory, isn't it? You know what I mean? Well, I wouldn't even call it a theory because it's not even based on facts. It's actually just conspiracy lunacy. And, you know, also, I like, we got to understand that these people who believe that um, that homosexuality is is a bad, evil, wrong sin or something like that. Well, there's prior causes for why they believe that. And and I think that we know some of those causes. For one thing, a lot of people are are taught, you know, it's an abomination, you know, like from the book of Leviticus in the Bible, since many of them um, have their morality supposedly based on that. So that's where they usually get this idea that oh well god hates homosexuals and all that and then you know the westboro baptist church has been a big part of that yeah sociologically history there have been taboos against homosexuality in pretty much every culture of the world you know it's so it's it's not an issue just related to like the bible or religion you know basically that that practice has been traditionally frowned upon. I think in some, some societies it's accepted. For example, even like with some societies, um, they have these sexual initiation rites where let's say a woman who's 30 years old will take let's say a boy who's like 
11 or 12 or something and teach that 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 um, that boy how to have sex properly and this some of these societies you know deem that completely acceptable so like, but again like how in general most societies throughout the world throughout history have had um kind of like a non-religious um basically um taboo against homosexuality and i have a feeling it has to do with survival with in other words like to the extent that that men are uh, pairing up with and women um with women that it decreases the likelihood of of, of this of the survival of the of the of the culture of this of the people you know because like for example i think in um in christianity there there were the essenes or uh, judaism actually the Essene uh, sect that were different from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and Essenes apparently were, um, they did not get married, they did not procreate, and so they're more Essenes. They, they kind of like basically um, non-bred themselves into non-existence. So that might be one example. You know, talking about like the discrimination against the gays, you know, fine, it's not a completely religious taboo, but I think we, we, we've evolved. In other words, like, um, Slavery might have been prevalent in, in many, many societies, and slavery, you know, wasn't sanctioned by religion or everything, but it's still wrong. So, in other words, the discrimination against gays, you know, that goes beyond, you know, um, their preference, you know, denies them a lot of rights. That it's just wrong. And again, the, the free will belief is so important because people are using the blame. People are blaming gays. And then wanting to punish them through the law. That that's what needs to change. Yeah, and you know what's interesting, George, is like you were pointing out, it, it go it extends beyond the Bible and Christianity, but there's it's been a taboo thing in many cultures for a long time. So there's obviously more to it than just the religious side of it. Um, and perhaps it does have something to do with the reproduction thing about the survival of the group um that that might be part of it um and also i think whenever there's something that's unusual some when something's uncommon you know somebody who you know doesn't eat meat is looked at as weird somebody who um who doesn't believe in god well they're looked at as weird you know and, and then someone who's homosexual in a world full of where most people are straight well, yeah, then people look at them like, well, you know, most of us are this way, so why are these people that way? And so they they have this idea that gets into their heads that something that's rare must be wrong somehow, like that normal is common. And in the minds of many people, it is. Absolutely. Uh, Nick, we did a few shows on, on, on this issue you exploring illusion of free will shows. Do you, do you remember any t uh, points that we covered there that we haven't actually talked about in this podcast? Uh, no. Okay, so we're pretty much covering it. That's good. That's good. So, like, so much of the well, there are, there are a lot of there are a lot of people that know that being gay is not a free will choice, but they attribute free will to every other type of choice. So they could. It's not one all all or one of all the other. They could say that. Being gay is obviously not free will, but there's other free will. There's free will in like you know what, uh, what food you're gonna eat in the morning. And people tend to confuse. Um, so they, I meet a lot of people that understand that oh, being sorry. gay is not a free choice, but other things are. Right, right. So the, the, there's kind of like a, it's um, you know, it's it's a contradiction. You're saying it's like you know they can they can see. No, they understand sex. They understand sexuality is is hardwired, but other things aren't. You're right. You're right. Um, and so, like, um, you, you you wonder why understand that. So what's the difference between, for example, like, you know, um, homosexuality being hardwired and other things being hardwired in, in a certain sense? You know, uh, Jamie, same, are you same. watching? Uh, Jamie, I'm just curious. Are you watching the World Cup right now? Um, what? Are you watching the World Cup right now? I'm just curious. Um, no, I haven't been watching it. I'm... Um... I used to be interested in like you know football like uh, when I was younger, but because uh, uh, England England's playing right now against Canada, I'm watching. Oh, it. I'm talking about the uh, women's World Cup. Oh, I see. Uh, anyway, you're not watching. I thought everybody in England watches this stuff. <laughs> no, I just got bored of it. <laughs> Looks like Canada's about to score, right? Nope. <laughs> and that.
that's the point because like there was like just a, a there was an article years ago when when you know, issue started to merge consciousness before nobody thought about it and some a sports magazine wrote an article on this like so many like athletes feel so proud of themselves when they score goals or stuff and like you know they were saying well like some of them recognize oh they feel lucky they don't have to feel like it. yeah you're right i think i think the better athletes the better an athlete is i would think that the, the more of a tendency they would have to understand that their talent their skill really is luck. It was something that, you know, they may have had to develop it, you know, through pro Essentially, they know that they had something that others didn't have and they weren't really responsible for it. They were just mm -hmm. lucky. You're right. Yeah, but it's, their training, their conditioning, though, to, you know, get them better at their, um, you know, talent. Yeah, what, but that's a good example, guys, because certain people have talents in certain areas and other people just don't. You know, some people are better at sports. Some people are better at playing musical instruments. Some people are better at writing. Some people are better at speaking, you know, and that's another thing of something that's hardwired is that like we'll notice right from an early age that certain children, they are just good at something. And often it tends to be something they like to do. And because they're good at it, that's part of what they like to do because they get that satisfaction of like, hey, I can do this thing. Right. And we understand that people's talents, the things that they're born with, um, is something they don't choose. But, of course, they still enjoy it. But we can't, like, blame other people for not being as talented as us or act like that we're better because we're better at football or we're better at playing the violin or something. The thing is with talented people is that they – they tend to think that they've achieved something through their own free will. And then they tend, some people who have you know, got certain talents will look down on others. Yeah, and you know what's interesting, Jamie, um, is that a lot of people, their whole identity, their value as a person comes from what they do. For some people, it's about what, how talented they are. For some people, it's about how much money they make or what kind of car they drive, or for how pretty they look, or something like that. And here's the deal, is that, it, you know, we don't take credit or blame for these things. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe you aren't so talented at something you like to be, but it's not your fault. And maybe you're, you're not so pretty, but it's not your fault either, <laughs> you know? You, so it's, it's a very bad thing to be getting your, your self-esteem from what you can achieve, because then when you can't achieve something and you feel like, oh, no, I'm a bad person because I'm unable to do this thing. And instead, um, I mean, I, that's just, I just tend to look at it as that everybody's equal just being a conscious living being. Oh, England just scored. <laughs> we can, you can tell Nick is excited about England scoring in football. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Now we're we're almost at our thirty minute mark, and we, we kind of covered the the whole topic of the whole gay, gay not being a choice, the issue of sexuality not being a choice. Say um, that people confuse um, you know male homosexuals. They can they confuse that with being feminine because some you know some like feminine guys who are not gay they sometimes get called gay. Like um, you're into My Little Pony, and some see that might see that as a sign of homosexuality and stuff, you know. Well, yeah, that's an important point, Jamie, because a lot of people, even before they knew I was in the My Little Pony, they said that I was gay. But, you know, here's the deal is that it doesn't matter so much because, first of all, they're wrong. I'm not gay. Second of all, even if I was, it wouldn't be my choice. And even if, even if we go hypothetically – that it was a choice. We know it's not, but let us hypothetically saying that sexuality was a choice. Well, who says that's the wrong choice? You know, I, that's another, that's kind of a whole other topic right there. Yeah, because what you're doing inside your own head is nobody else's business. Yeah, if it's not hurting somebody, then it really isn't anybody's business. And that's sort of how I look at it. Yeah, if I think about genocide or, you know, whatever, or medieval stuff, like, you know, just for the sake of the argument, it's nobody else's business. 
Okay, you've been listening to Free Will Science and Religion with Jana Klebs, George Ortega, Nick Vale, and Jamie Soden. And, well, I hope you've enjoyed this talk. It got a little off topic, but <laughs> it was fun.